a few here and there, and it worked fine in that regard. But what's happened in the last three years is it's turned into a financial engineering project, and with the advent of lease financing, no cost up front. Let me give you an example. In three years ago, we might have had, uh, on a customer base of 1.2 million customers, about <coughs> two to 300 customers that had residential with rooftop solar. The leasing model came into play, and uh, now we've got about 30, 32,000, and adding 1,000 customers a month on this. And the incentive to the customer that's doing this is one, no cost up front, and a dramatic reduction in some instances in their, their monthly electric bill. And essentially, they, those customers uh, are shifting the value of the grid onto the non-solar customers. And what we're looking at, I think the challenge for our industry to, to better fix this and incent the right kind of behavior and we're seeing it in some places, in Wisconsin and in, actually in Arizona with the Salt River Project a, a month ago, is to look at a, a three-component rate design which smart meters uh, uh, allow this to happen at the residential level where you start with a basic service charge, then a demand charge, and then an energy charge that is more closely aligned with uh, the actual avoided cost, which is typically a bit more than than, than fuel cost. And the example of uh, Salt River Project, when they propose that, and they've got about 800,000 customers in the uh, parts of metropolitan Phoenix and Maricopa County, uh, the solar leasing companies uh, scream, they pretty much scream at any kind of proposal, uh, that it's bad for their business and the development of solar. And, but Salt River Project put in effectively this kind of a rate design, and the leasing business shut down within their service territory. But interestingly, within about two weeks of this doom and gloom, some local installers, which I'd say are the, the, the larger local installers and true entrepreneurs, tackled the situation and started marketing a product that uses some battery technology, relatively small amount of it, and the solar panels with the idea to be able to charge the batteries during the, peak, the uh, uh, peak of solar production that doesn't coincide with the utility peak, and to be able to shift that peak just a few hours, uh, or that solar generation onto the peak and lower the customer's uh, demand cost, which was frankly pretty smart, and there, there you incent the kind of behavior you want to see because it's a win for the customer. They reduce their, their overall energy cost, and it's a win for the utility because it reduces the growth in demand. And uh, I think that's going to be a challenge uh, for, for all of us in this industry. The epicenter started in Arizona, the sunniest spot in the continental U.S., but uh, we've seen it move to other states and the controversies, and uh, we've ended up with a lot of political theater Turn it over to you, Bill. Bill. All right. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to do a uh, little bit deeper dive into the issue of competitive markets. You've heard that addressed by both Chris and Nick. But uh, I think people, frankly, underestimate the problems we've got in the competitive markets. Uh, specifically, when you talk about the Northeast, I mean, frankly, we've got anything but competitive markets. We're dealing with States, governments picking winners and losers through various subsidies that continue. Uh, we've got the lack of appropriate price formation from both a capacity perspective and an energy perspective. And frankly, we're not properly valuing the attributes. It doesn't matter if it's a nuclear plant. It doesn't matter if it's a load-following plant. It doesn't matter if it's a peaking plant. They should be valued by the attributes they provide to the system. I really believe the issue we've got, you've got a lack of vision on behalf of the ISOs. If you go back to traditional utility planning, you always had a resource plan. And while I realize those aren't necessarily in vogue these days in these markets, you at least had some objectives that you were trying to meet. <clears throat> Simply put, those objectives are ensuring reliability, having economic sustainability for the customers, 
but also for the investors and maintaining environmental sustainability. And I would challenge anyone to look at any of these competitive markets and be able to tell me exactly what those objectives are as you look into the future. We've made significant progress in identifying the problem, but we've also started to identify the solution. Earlier this year, NEI, EEI, EPSA, and a number of the gas associations came up with a consensus on what needs to be done in these markets. That's pretty unprecedented to get those groups together. And I think it highlights the importance of this issue. So those principles are pretty simple. One is, as you look at price formation, you've got to reflect actual cost. All the units that are dispatched need to be included in locational marginal pricing. You've got to get the day ahead commitment right. And that day ahead commitment has to include everything that you need to operate the system, including reserves. Okay. You also need to address the issue of operator-based actions during the day. That should be reflected in pricing. That are, those are actual cost. Those should be reflected in market cost, but they are not. Lastly, we need more transparency. We need to really be able to understand what they're doing and why, and the market price formation needs to consider all of those actions. So we've had a number of discussions with ISOs. We frankly have had a number of discussions with FERC, both the commissioners and the staff. While we're encouraged by some recent legislation that's been proposed by Senator Murkowski, quite frankly, we can't wait for legislation. We need FERC to take some action to update its policies and address price formation issues. If we don't see any progress from that, we will see more of the Vermont Yankee situations. And I'm not sure that anybody appreciates what the consequences are from that as it relates to reliability, electric prices, and, and environmental issues such as carbon reduction. The Clean Power Plan is another policy that doesn't appropriately value existing nuclear generation. A 6% credit across the board just doesn't cut it. So I say that, that we really need to push our legislators to create a sense of urgency at FERC, and I know we're doing our best, but also, and also at the EPA, to make sure that we're taking the steps to properly value these resources. And we're not asking for anything special. We're not asking for subsidies. We're asking for a much more balanced approach to the market. Otherwise, we're going to be facing some real challenges from a reliability, cost, and environmental perspective. Chris? I, I uh, would second everything you said. I'll, I'll move into a little bit different area. Um, Today, um, our business uh, models as the wires company and generation companies are very capital intensive. We invest in long lived assets that are clean, reliable, but we're also the economic engine for the communities that we serve. Um, that, that provides a high value uh, to the community. But we live in a world um, where technology is changing faster than we've ever seen it before. Uh, the, it's, uh, the, the, the energy infrastructure is a highly politicized uh, area. If you want to um, touch your constituents, talk about their electric bills, and everybody that votes for you pays an electric bill. Our customers want a lot more control, and, and it doesn't have to be economic. It doesn't have to be rational control, but there is a desire to enhance their interface with their demands, and that's changing the model. We have to work to protect our assets, the, the, the investments that we've made, um, not only for our, our customers, but our shareholders and our employees. We're, we're at a time right now where um, the utility model of the past needs to significantly adjust. We need to be much more nimble. We need to be much more innovative. 
we have to be responsive to the customer's requests and uh, be unsentimental about our previous business models. But we also must demand fair treatment on, and, and uh, knowing we can't stay status quo, we need to uh, demand uh, fair treatment on the investments that we've made and recognize the value that we provide to the consumer. You've heard what Nick has said uh, about the investments on his side or what, what Don has been facing in Arizona. Um, headlines uh, from special interest groups can swing um, uh, the, the, the thoughts of our consumers and our regulators to the point that it is totally irrational, but we need to keep our voice out there. Just, just an example, today um, Exelon has uh, over 22 billion in rate base at its three utilities. To meet the reliability requirements and the customer demands over the next five years, we will be investing $15 billion more, which 50% of that would be added to the 22 billion of rate base. So we'll have about 30 billion of rate base and you have people running around saying the utility model and the, the wires network that we have developed over the years uh, is dead. It's, it's something of the past, but, but that's not the reality. We will spend millions on our, gener our bi or billions on our generation uh, facilities over the next five years. And we need to have the fair treatment that, that Bill has, has talked about. But what, what I've been working with, uh, with our leadership team at Exelon, and we spent uh, a day and a half last week um, continuing to evaluate this, is engaging and immersing yourself on these emerging technologies and how can they be best applied while maintaining a relevance as the utility, the energy provider to the customers that we serve. And I think that's gonna be a significant challenge going forward. Having the right information flowing to the key stakeholders about the value of the grid, the value of our, our long-lived assets, how we are the economic engine within the communities that we serve, making sure that people understand things like microgrids may sound very good, they're sexy, but um, as we've seen in New York, um, there's a cost-benefit analysis that makes these uh, uh, widespread utilization of microgrids versus a large integrated grid uh, uh, economically challenged. And so for legislative uh, or special interest groups that are marketing their own technology to take over our regulatory compact um, is definitely the wrong thing. But us as the energy suppliers today need to greatly adjust the way we approach um, technology uh, and, and the customers that we serve. Well, thank you. Uh, we have... Uh opportunity here for a very stimulating discussion, and I'm hoping that our, uh, my colleagues up here will uh, not hesitate to jump into the discussion. Uh, just a couple of key points that come out, and if we have a little time, we'll take questions from the floor. Uh, Chris first emphasized uh, diversity, and uh, thank you. The study you mentioned on diversity was one we'd done with NEI, so thank you for that, and I think that's a kind of starting point. Uh, Nick, you warned about uh, uh, moving away from utilities and instead turn it over to people driving up in pickup trucks. Uh, as a vision of competitive markets. Don, uh, financial engineer in replacing uh, resource planning. And Bill, I guess what you were talking about is uh, non-competitive markets rather than competitive markets. Uh, lack of transparency, which is a point that I'd made in uh, my remarks. And I was thinking as we talked about the exclusion of nuclear uh, really in a serious way from the uh, clean power plan Maybe we should call it a partly clean power plant since it leaves out nuclear. But um, so you've all made the point. We have 400,000 of, uh, of uh, megawatts of coal and nuclear. That's the backbone of the system. And uh, in one way or another, those two are be great pressures. You've described a little bit about how to respond to it. Um, OK, what, what actually needs to be done and what's the odds of getting it done? to preserve this option. Yeah, so uh, certainly uh, some of the competitive markets are trying to address the situation. Uh, and Chris obviously has been intimately involved with this as well in the PJM market, uh, focusing on uh, actually 
trying to come up with capacity performance models uh, that that pay generators for what they actually provide to the grid. And if it's if it's done in a secure fashion, um, with a fuel source that's secure, then then there ought to be some form of compensation for that. And uh, I think it needs to be recognized in, in in all the competitive markets because we operate our our nuclear plant, uh, Cook Nuclear, is is in. Um, an integrated regulated utility where resource planning continues to operate. Um, certainly you get, you recover your costs plus a return uh, on equity. And I see the competitive markets trying to emulate that, but not in a very good way. I mean, um, and, and so it makes you wonder why you even move into competitive markets to begin with. But nevertheless, um, with, with that kind of activity in place, there's, there's no long-term product uh, which even if even in a competitive market you have purchase power arrangements and other things that are long-term products that can, that co-ops, munis, and others will come to the regulated utilities and, and acquire supply in the future, but you don't have that in competitive markets. It's all you know either a one-year capacity market, three years in advance, and and there's a lot of tinkering that goes on in it where where no one really understands what the rules are. So are, so are the regulators hearing you all? I think making progress. The, I think they're starting to get it, but but how to address it is still a question because they're hearing from many parties that that really don't understand how the grid operates. Oh, Chris, I I I, I agree. Um, it, it's a difficult situation. There's there's capacity um, compensation for the reliability and the availability, um, but there's also the energy pricing component, the the price formation. Um, in many areas of the country, we have uh, decided that we will want to have a renewable portfolio standard and we have an arbitrary number um, that was chosen. And it was these numbers were chosen at a time that we thought we'd continue to have load growth as we'd seen through the 70s, 80s and, and into the 90s when, when load was continuing to grow. The reality is we're having low to negative load growth in most of our areas across the country, and we're forcing in uh, subsidized renewable generation that's causing a significant pricing challenge. Um, in some areas, some of our plants at the night period are seeing over 16% of the time were negative prices. You can't sustain a base load generation asset when you're having to, to run it um, so these, uh, on top. Yeah, so these markets were set up not taking into account what you said, subsidized renewables on a big scale, and also really cheap natural gas. Right. The premises, Jim. Oh, yeah. we, yeah. we have to compete against natural gas. And, and I think the, the, the capacity component gives us the, the level playing field. Um, unless you have fixed fuel guaranteed, um, you can't get the capacity, uh, it can't be rewarded for the capacity component. Bill? Well, I, I agree. You know, I don't, I guess I, th I don't think this is really that difficult for FERC to address. I mean, so while it's complicated, it, it falls into some pretty clean buckets. And we started to address the capacity pricing. Some things have been done there, performance incentives, et cetera. Energy pricing, I mean, what we're basically talking about is including actual cost in dispatch in the LMP. Um, and so I think it could be addressed. But it becomes a very political issue because what happens is you're going to increase short run prices. That is going to create a lot of political pressure. And so to me, part of the balance is someone's got to have the courage to take that step. We'll see a slight increase in energy prices, but we will have a much more stable portfolio over time and reduce the volatility of pricing to the consumer. Do you see in this clean power plan that there is going to be a recognition that this nuclear component has to be preserved as a low, as a carbon-free generation source. Any, any good signs there? The, I, the EPA recognizes um, the the issue about the six percent and the arbitrary use of that six percent. Some areas have forty-five percent of the nuclear assets economically challenged today. So, um, but we haven't got the. Uh, what we're asking for um, as NEI, EEI, what we've asked for is equal treatment for all uh, non-carbon emitting sources. Right. I, think, I, don't, I don't think that 
there was an intention to, to exclude nuclear, effectively exclude nuclear from the clean power plan. I think it was just a miscalculation and one that, that showed a lack of recognition of how markets operate in our industry and how the system operates in our industry. So you didn't see this hostility? To I didn't see, I, I really don't see hostility. I think, I think, it's, I think it's more of an issue of, of uh, okay, how do, we, how do we compensate for it during the cycle of emission reductions? Um, from, from year to year, and what happens when a, when a nuclear unit is retired or what happens when a nuclear right. unit is brought on. So, so those mechanisms um, are, are really, that's what's being thought of right now, I, you know, right. at least what I get. So let me pick up on a comment from Chris about uh, load growth not being what might have been anticipated. Just to ask you all, you know, we're out of the recession, we're supposed to be back, except this last quarter, back in economic growth. What do you see happening in each of your service areas and your markets in terms of demand? So uh, much of our economy has been driven. Uh, we're, we're serve 11 states, and we're a third commercial, a third residential, a third uh, manufacturing industrial. And it's primarily the growth has been driven by shale gas. Uh, we cover many of the shale gas counties. Uh, shale gas counties have grown upwards to 30 to 45 percent. And so ancillary businesses associated with that, piping, manufacturing, chemical manufacturing, those kinds of things continue to expand. Now, um, we still see production uh, continue to increase, but obviously uh, new well heads and that kind of thing are, are starting to, to back off a little bit. But that's primarily what's been driving the economy, the energy renaissance that's occurring within, within the footprint. Uh, as far as uh, load increases, we still anticipate um, a half a percent to a percent uh, increase in load. Um, uh, but that says to the entire industry, it's about optimization. It's not about uh, trying to answer ever increasing right. load growth in the future. Right. Don? Now, longer term, uh, we're, we're expecting load growth and the, the one plus range. And uh, historically, before the recession, Arizona was the fastest growing uh, load in, in the country. Customer growth was in the four to 6% range and load wow. was in the three to four, almost too much to, to, to keep up with. Uh, I'm kind of bullish on the economy. It's, uh, th this recession I think is unlike almost anyone we've had in, in my time. Uh, in that uh, the Im lasting impact on consumer confidence. And, uh, you know, in past recessions, if you and or your spouse didn't lose a job, there wasn't much of a recession. And, uh, but this last recession, if you didn't, uh, kept employed, but all of a sudden your $500,000 home with a $400,000 mortgage on it, was now worth $250,000, which is a pretty accurate number of what happened in Arizona. That kind of curbs your uh, desire to spend money and gets you into a mode uh, that, uh, of conserving cash and working on the, the personal balance sheet. And I think we're seeing that across the country in, in many regards. And when we had you know, the, the collapse of 29, it almost took till World War II to kind of yeah. come out of that and uh, in this case, we're doing it with quantitative easing, or trying to. A, a lot of quantitative easing. Yeah, a lot of quantitative <laughs> easing, and we're still not Keep out easing. of it. So I think yeah. that's still uh, lingering there, and it's gonna be uh, a, a few years down the road before we, right. we get out of this. Now, Bill, yours is, you're a different story, because uh, yeah. in a sense, you too, like uh, Nick, are a beneficiary of uh, what's happened in the natural gas side, as well as finding it a problem. So while I have, uh, I'm, the, I'm on the wrong end of that in terms of the responsibility with the merchant uh, fleet. Our regulated uh, service territory is really enjoying substantial growth. I mean, we're seeing significant industrial growth due to low natural gas prices, what we call the industrial renaissance. And a lot of foreign companies moving in. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're seeing a lot of chemical companies come in, LNG, um, you know, uh, other related businesses that are starting to either, ex they're either expanding existing facilities or building new facilities in the Louisiana, Texas area. So along with that also goes residential and commercial growth as well. So we're really blessed in the situation we're at in the Gulf area 
as it relates to load growth, which really puts us in a good position to add infrastructure. And so we're adding a lot of generation resources, largely gas-fired resources, but we're also to, able to maintain very reasonable customer rates uh, because of the fact, obviously low fuel prices, but these are high capacity factor facilities. And so the customer, while we're adding rate base, customers are not seeing significant in, uh, increases in their bills. Right. Chris? So um, Southeast Pennsylvania, um, Pico zone, we're, we're seeing an increase, uh, a pretty good increase in industrial load all around petrochem refinery. Um, and so that's, that's made greater than 1%, but it's been positive. Residential, um, flat to half percent, same around ComEd. Uh, our, our biggest area that we're in that we're seeing the, the strong load growth is on the generating side in Texas. And that's what's prompted us to uh, start to develop two new CCGTs. And we have a few peakers uh, uh, that we're also developing. So that's responding to the same thing that Bill is talking about. It, it, it definitely is. We see equilibrium in, in ERCOT uh, 2021, 2022, um, somewhere in that. And so um, we'll be on the, the, the leading edge of that supply. So it's interesting that at least three out of four of you are this unconventional revolution actually is, uh, in addition to cheap gas over here, it means been stimulating demand in other parts of your market. Don, you describe yourself as being in the sunniest spot in America, which means that you are a target for distributed generation electric power, uh, solar power and so forth. Right. Uh, Tell us what the truth is. <laughs> you just, you just as opposed to the slogans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us what you really think. You didn't have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> See what happens when you come from a really sunny state. Well, you, it is a sunny state, and our customers want solar, and we're supplying that. Interestingly, uh, my company actually had a, a solar test facility, the only one like it in the nation for about 40 years. And it goes back to, uh, it used to be in Prescott, Arizona at the airport, was the largest solar installation in the United States. It's about the size of this room. And uh, in 2008, we announced the Solana generating station, 280 uh, megawatt capacity in the interest of using parabolic mirrors and with uh, four large saline tank, molten, uh, sailing uh, to store heat, and it'll actually produce solar energy till about 11 o'clock at night, which is, gets us through our peak in that. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, the following year, 2009, at the, at the SEPA convention in California, which is a solar industries organization, they named me utility CEO of the year. Since that point in time, we And, and you continue to hold that uh, right, title. Right, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got that in my office. Since that point in time, I've invested three, our, my company's invested $3 billion in solar, and now with the advent of rooftop leasing model, they accuse me of trying to kill solar, which I'm so not doing a very about, good job of. So, yeah, yeah, you've got to step up your game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so ex explain how it looks to you, what the, what the Shall we say the pluses and the minuses of the leasing model are? Well, I don't think there are any pluses. I think the uh, the, the customers. It's true when you look at, we're less than three years into it. We're already finding customers, several hundred, that have issues. The biggest one is they no one reads the contract, and the expectation of that ever changing is probably slim, but they slim and non-existent. But when they go to sell their home, they go, or when they apply for a home equity loan, they find out they've already got a second on the house for about thirty to $40,000. And then when they go to sell the home, because of the, uh, these leases are all packaged and into the sec sold into the secondary market, they require an extremely high credit rating for the new homeowner to uh, assume the lease. And many of these folks can't find someone to assume the lease. We just had a, a few months back, one of our state senators, uh, Debbie Lesko, uh, she had an 81-year-old friend of the family that had a year earlier signed a 20-year lease. <laughs> Optimist. Yeah, yeah, ex <laughs> exactly. And uh, 
too optimistic because her health deteriorated somewhat and she had to uh, move into an assisted living facility and all her equity was tied up in her house. And then she found out she had a second on the house and couldn't find anybody to qualify to buy the house. And this story repeats itself by the hundreds. And uh, uh, I, I fear what's going to exist. Uh, so you, I mean, so from your perspective, this is really financial engineering as much as... Exactly. Right. Yeah, and you can debate the wisdom of any retail consumer signing a 20-year lease for one an evolving technology, uh, but one that you can't get out of very easily. Right. Any of you others want to comment on the distributed, the role of distributed? Yeah, so uh, um, we're certainly focused. We, we've done some uh, utility-scale solar. We, we've done some rooftop, actually. Uh, but uh, you have to understand what the resource actually provides. And most consumers don't really understand that. I mean, you're not going to run your air conditioning. You're not going to run uh, pumps and motors with, with rooftop solar panels. Um, and even even battery walls, for that matter. But but um, and, and I think you have to sort of understand the economics of it. And the business plan is around um, incentives, both state, federal, um, and net metering. And and certainly the industry is very focused on the net metering issue, uh, because obviously we need to be able to, to get the revenue to support uh, the grid itself, because many of these customers aren't unplugging from the grid. Uh, and at the same time, we need to make sure that um, rate mechanisms are in place so that uh, poor customers aren't subsidizing rich customers. And, and that's really the process we're going through. You, you try to start that process, and you become, that's when you become attacked. Yeah, and, and I think there has to be some it rationalization big, It is that. a big income transfer that's really yes, going on. Yes, it is. No, there's no doubt. Uh, yeah, huge. Matter of fact, I think there's an article today or yesterday about um, uh, Solar City uh, not um, uh, taking into account the battery walls because because it would take away from the from the uh, net metering uh, right. revenue. So so the financial case has to support itself, and I think that's where Chris has been very vocal about um, these incentives need to be adjusted so that you can see the real. Um, economic issues of these different types of supplies. You need everything. There are places where wind has a high capacity factor uh, and it's very, very good from a resource perspective. The same with utility scale solar at injection points on the grid. There's all kinds of positive aspects to it, but you have to recognize what that application is. Right. Chris, you talked about, uh, you spent a day and a half looking at emerging technologies, how to adjust them. Tell us what what do you see? I mean, what's, what's at the top of the list, do you think? Distributed generation um, is, is it was, with subsidies is, uh, is highly disruptive. Um, but but what, what we've tried to do is adjust our thinking from disruptive technologies to enabling technologies. And if that's what the customer wants, how do we develop the regulatory regime that if they want an uneconomic source of energy, they can have that. But the, the you know the, the regulatory uh, conversations that we've had. But what we're looking at fuel cells and the application of fuel cells um, in in how they may make penetration, mostly New York, California markets with high prices. Um, looking at uh, different technologies that we can invest in. Uh, or, or uh, engage in, you're looking at big data. We, we put a lot of money into IT systems and we have a lot of people that want that data. How do we use that data to provide for the customer in a more economic way? Some of the key issues around that, but it, it all is gonna be uh, enabled or disrupted based off of the regulatory compact that we're able to develop. It, just, a, just a side story to show what we're dealing with. I was called into a, a high-level elected official's office a couple of years ago and said, you know, I, I'd, I'd like it if you and your company would not go against my initiative on this renewable energy project you wanted to have. And, You're not going to tell us what state. No, I better okay. not. I'm already in trouble there <laughs> okay. anyways. So, 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 so I said, you know, look, we've modeled this, and I can show you this is the most expensive path forward you can take to provide renewable power. Statement back was, listen, 
I don't know what technology is ever going to be built or if the project goes forward, but you don't know how this thing pulls. And that's what we're dealing with. The, 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 the individual technology lobbies, we're, 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 we've got nuclear fighting against wind, fighting against solar, because we're, we're promoting technologies versus outcomes. Promote a low carbon standard and let the economics of, of the, the marketplace drive what we use. It's, um, but as long as we've got very solid lobbying and marketing regimes based off of individual technologies, being able to entice and engage consumers to think it's something that it's not, and elected officials jump on because the polling's good, we're in a tough situation. Well, do you want to talk maybe about some of your specific plants, like what's happening in Illinois, what you're, where you are with specific nuclear power plants? And so we have five units uh, uh, out of the 11 in Illinois right now that are negative cash flow and a drag on earnings. Um, it's, it's greatly, uh, uh, they're greatly challenged based off of the overdevelopment of wind and the constraints of the transmission system to continue to move the power east. We have a flow from the west on, on regulated developed wind that's just coming over the seams from ISO into PJM. So we have, uh, you know, we've, we've got NIHUB, Northern Illinois prices suppressed, but we have specific plants within MISO and NIHUB that are, that are trading eight to 10 or six to 10 dollars at different times off uh, lower at the bus than there. So, so you've got uh, um, a, 20, a 29, 30 dollar megawatt plant uh, working in a 24, 25 dollar market and they're just not sustainable. So what we've asked, the state has over the years has provided um, market subsidies for uh, or incentives for wind for solar, for hydro, for clean coal. And in Illinois, 60% of the power that's generated is carbon free. 90% of that uh, generation is nuclear. And those plants are about to go away if we don't get something. So waiting for the clean energy plan to come out is not something that we can do. Uh, we can't wait for years losing money. We've been losing money for years. We've made this public. We've said something has to be done. There's a legislative uh, package right now that would level the playing field between all carbon-free sources that would allow these plants to continue to operate until we get 111D out and the state looks how to implement it. So there's a sunset clause. 111D comes, we, we transition into whatever the state implementation plan is, but it's to, to take uh, uh, and, and a market-based fix um, um, to those plants and, and help um, save them. Right. Bill, what, give us what your, your our biggest course. headache. Well, I mean, our, our biggest challenge right now is, uh, you know, with single unit sites up in the Northeast. And uh, so I think, you know, we got some temporary relief during the polar vortex last year. Um, but, you know, we're dealing with a situation where we see probably cash costs ex escalate at 5% a year. Uh, obviously, market prices have declined. Um, and when you've got a situation where you've got a single unit site, uh, lower economies of scale, those units are marginal. And, I mean, frankly, if, if we don't see some policy change uh, on the uh, capacity and energy side of things and on the providing some reasonable value for attributes, whether that be carbon-free emissions, whether that be on-site fuel, um, you know, we are going to be faced with tough decisions. You know, we don't, currently don't have plans to shut those down, but, you know, you can appreciate the amount of capital you've got invested in those facilities as you look down the road, and if there is no indication of any change in policy, uh, we'll be facing some tough decisions and going so forward. And so is your focus on the FERC, on the state? Where well, you we have... You know, we have focused, uh, we've worked really with the ISOs, but to be perfectly frank, we haven't seen a whole lot of movement. Uh, and that's a very difficult situation because of the, you know, the uh, impact that the stakeholders have. I mean, obviously, load does not want prices to increase, um, but I don't, I'm not sure they understand the consequences if they don't address this right. matter and more and more plants and of course, come in offline. In New York State, you have a very determined want to go to the world of microgrids. Well, absolutely. You've, you've all heard of the REV program that uh, the chair, Audrey Zibelman, has proposed. And uh, 
that's fraught with a number of challenges. I think Chris mentioned that probably the most important is look at the economics of some of these proposed solutions to customers, what it means to their bills. Um, and so while we certainly support that type of uh, technology and we understand that the world's changing, uh, they need to figure out some type of plan to bridge the gap over the next 10 to 15 years while that evolves. So from my perspective, they're overly aggressive on their plans to implement and they underestimate the overall cost to consumers uh, that will be uh, right. caused as a result of their policy. Don, what, what's your situation with your nuclear? Well, we're in a regulated market, but uh, I was just talking before this session with Chris. We've had this phenomenon over the last year to 18 months, particularly in the shoulder months. Midday, you know, we, we butt right up against California, which has a very high renewable energy standard. And solar production is typically concentrated at the 11 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And California pays us to take their power. And without overanalyzing a situation when you have to pay somebody to take your product, something's wrong. Right. <laughs> that you've subsidized. It's called <laughs> subsidy. <laughs> that matches no load profile. Right, right. So, so Nick, what's a threat in your area, so your nuclear, and how are you handling it? So, uh, certainly the issues that, that, uh, that Bill and Chris brought up, and, and Don as well, uh, we have in our service territory too. I, I think probably one of the biggest challenges th that we face is there, there, there are technical changes that are occurring with, with technologies that are occurring regardless of what the regulatory construct may be. And, and I think that we've got to have a more progressive regulatory construct to support our ability to invest in these types of technologies and a, an adequate time frame to really plan and do this wisely. I think that's one one flaw with the with the uh, clean power plan among its many flaws but but one is um, for policymakers to just dream up targets um, and put it through regulations uh, when it hasn't been well thought out and uh, and really you could wind up in a better situation from a you know whether you're trying to uh, reduce emissions or whatever if you take the time to get it right and optimize the grid the way it should be optimized and make that transition in a credible fashion. Uh, because otherwise you're gonna do suboptimal solutions that will not only impair the ability for new nuclear to get built, but also impair the ability for existing generation to continue to be maintained. Uh, so th there really has to be much more discussion and I think the utilities themselves we're not as biased as people think we are. Um, we do know and understand how the grid operates, and it'd be great if, if, uh, if they listened to us a little bit more. Right. Well, on that question, I mean, and I think, uh, Don, you alluded to it. It's one thing when you have a small amount of it, intermittent power. When you have big amounts, it, it really puts pressure in different ways in the grid, and certainly Germany is finding out a great deal right. with a lot more instability. How do you change your operations to uh, managing the grid to, to deal with it? Well, you make, uh, because of the phenomena we see with the, the duck curve, and ours isn't as exaggerated as, as California is, but it's starting to evolve there. And, and for instance, we're at uh, a plant we call Ocotillo. We name all our plants pretty much after desert. Uh, trees and cactuses, and uh, <laughs> that's what happens when you're the sunniest yeah, spot but, in the country. But we're, yeah. we're spending five to six hundred million dollars on uh, simple cycle uh, yeah. machines to, to catch that ramp because it, it 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 just goes straight up, right? And is very severe, and that that's a cost. So you're configuring there, also. Uh, how we designed the, the grid between uh, some of the smart switching technologies and that to deploy that. And, uh, you know, to follow up on Nick's comments, if, if the regulators and policymakers had kind of listened to the experts in the room uh, about grid design and grid maintenance and the cost of the grid, you go back to, to, to solar. Again, customers want it, but when you start talking about the mechanics of, of the grid, it, it, you quickly lose people. For instance, in the summer in Arizona, 
the, your typical home, the average size home is about 2,200 square foot, and that'll support a four to seven kW solar installation. Peak of the day, your air conditioning is cycling four to eight times an hour. Each cycle takes a, a average size air conditioner at 27 kW surge. So you need the, the grid four to seven, four to eight times an hour. And no matter how big you build the solar, you can cover your entire roof and your entire yard without the grid. Right. The air conditioner's <laughs> not gonna start. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes, uh, the gap between reality and, uh, yeah. and belief. Um, I think, Chris, in, was in your remarks uh, earlier, you mentioned that 69 reactors are being built internationally. Uh, what role should U.S. industry play? Uh, what are our economic, our safety, uh, non-proliferation elements in that? You know, I, I think um, the process and in, in the, the suppliers here, Westinghouse, Jeff, and others, uh, GE, um, that they have been hamstrung in trade negotiations based off of the time it takes for State Department, Department of Energy to, to process um, uh, the requests with individual company countries. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're held out of Saudi Arabia right now. They could be bidding on potentially uh, putting U.S. technologies uh, to work. Uh, and U.S. standards. And U.S. standards, design standards. Mm -hmm to work in those countries. Um, the the sub-suppliers, the valve manufacturers, the pump manufacturers, they all need to uh, be, be able to, to engage in this trade. Um, and it only will make our supply chain for the domestic plant stronger if, if our, our suppliers can have a, a much more level playing field. Um, the thought that, that uh, we are gonna compete against sovereign governance, uh, governments on, on financing um, it, it's 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 very tough not to have an export uh, bank that, that right. you can you can gain support. It creates jobs. It creates a stronger supply chain. There's there's an alignment on the design principles and operating standards. It it um, I think it's a natural, but but it's you have to have an administration um, and a state department that is is dwarfed multiple administrations that would become much more supportive. Right. And as you say, with Exim Bank under attack, that would right. make our position more difficult. I think we can take a few questions if there are any. Are there microphones? Is that uh, so the people with the microphones are walking around? If anybody has a question. Go, well, I can't see any. No, so, okay. There's a hand there. Is there a hand? <laughs> yeah, we okay. got a hand. Too close so to the short, short question and just identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Hinsey from UXC uh, Consulting Company. Um, we do a lot of analysis, forecast, nuclear power out long term, and I think this discussion has been made before, but um, if you look at specifically all of the plants you operate in the U.S., uh, lifetimes by 2030, 2040, a lot of them are going to start shutting down, if not sooner, because of the discussions you already had, but if they, even if they operate normally, license extensions and all that, it's not going to be forever. Where do you see the, the U.S. nuclear industry 20, 30 years from now? What, I mean, with those likely retirements, uh, what's the future hold? So um, you have to have uh, the, the right market rules um, that compensate the technology um, or, uh, or, or the, the regulatory uh, footprint that wants diverse uh, energy. Um, for me, in a competitive market, looking at the, the capital cycle um, for a new unit, um, it, it's very difficult to, to take that dilution. Um, so we, we have said if there's a future for us to be investing, first we have to have the right market design but it would be much more around uh, an economic and efficient modular reactor. And um, being able to cut that, that, that long capital cycle down would, would, uh, uh, would make that um, much more achievable. That, that's, that's the only thing we, we could see. Um, today, for us to develop a competitive uh, dual unit site uh, within the competitive market, you'd need a $25 carbon tax 
uh, and uh, a, a long run natural gas greater price greater than $8 an MMBTU. And we don't see either one of those happening anytime soon. So say there, we're, that we forget about global warming and carbon, we, if just on natural gas prices alone, you'd have to have greater than a $13 an MMBTU to be able to compete. So um, we're very challenged on the conventional large scale um, baseload nuclear generation from the competitive standpoint, but a modular reactor that's efficient, uh, cost effective, and um, its capital cycle is greatly reduced would give us a potential. Yeah, I think, I think a key point here is, is a great question because it brings up a, several issues. One is we've got a lot of generation that investment decisions are being made now. Um, and we have to have some sense of certainty around not only new investments, but continuing the existing investments. Now we're doing a life cycle management program right now at, at our Cook station. It's operating great. We expect it to operate for a long time to come. Um, but if you have a multitude of nuclear units retiring at the same time because decisions have been made not to extend them further or not to build new nuclear, that's going to be a huge issue for this country. And, and we have to get in front of policymakers on the front end to say that, you know, this industry is the most capital intensive industry in, in the nation. We spend over $90 billion a year. Um, and capital investments, and it's incumbent to make sure those long-term investments continue to be managed. That's a, that's a big issue for us. And so for a company like mine, I mean, we're $27 billion market cap, so um, uh, $7 billion to build a new nuclear station is a pretty sizable bet given today's environment of low natural gas prices and where technology can go in the future. Well, so I think it's pretty critical for us to evaluate where technology is moving, and it's moving on all fronts, not just in solar, wind, and everything else. It's moving in nuclear, moving in other resources as well. And we got to take account for that and make sure that we remain balanced from a risk perspective because this nation has experienced during times in its history where different resources were not available. And so we've got to get it right and start right. now. Well, uh, Chris, when you were still flying back from Chicago, I mentioned in my remarks how what was supposed to be a 25, 30 year development for nuclear power was compressed into 10 years, partly because Admiral Rickover was both in charge of the civilian program and the Navy, and he wrote memos to himself <laughs> and got it done. Uh, on small modular nuclear reactors, do you guys see uh, enough focus on that and uh, enough kind of uh, political and commercial energy going into it? We're, we're glad to see the DOE's support of New Scale, but but there are other um, uh, other vendors that, that are that are applying or trying to, to make the investment. Um, we, we we need to make sure that we understand through the design phase the f uh, feasibility, and then we have to look really hard at the regulatory requirements and and how different that they would be from a larger uh, uh, baseload unit. Um, uh, I, I think we could see more uh, support, and, um, and we need to, as an industry, support the companies that are, that are out in the development phase now. So, I mean, is it too soon to even put a date as to when we might first see commercial? From my knowledge, yeah. It, yeah. it, it, is, it is too soon. I, I think there's, there's um, from to, to adopt them into a, a merchant environment, we'll have to see uh, the prototypes go. Right. I think there's one more question over there. I think this, and then we'll. Can you identify yourself too? No. Uh, Jim Stout from Precision Custom Components. Uh, question for Dr. Jurgen and the panelists. Uh, in your book, Dr. Jurgen, The Quest, you describe the consequences to social unrest and other issues of countries that rely on an energy economy or an oil economy. And as we export more. LNG and continue to produce cheap oil and gas, uh, what risks do we have regarding those uh, oil economy exposures and what uh, government and private market steps should we take to avoid them? And I note the panelists' uh, comments about that the increments of demand increase have been owing to low energy prices. So do you mean unrest in the United States or another? Applied to the United, as oh. applied to us, 
relative to your, uh, your premise. Well, if we speak about market rules here, I don't think I'm supposed to get questions. I'm only supposed to ask <laughs> questions. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, I'll break the market rules and uh, say that I, I think that we can have uh, political controversy, but I don't see, I don't think we're in the position of a heavily resource dependent of Venezuela or Nigeria or some of the Middle East countries. So I think it's largely beneficial for us to be an exporter, not only on economic terms, uh, but really for, it changes, I know when I go to Europe, I go to Asia, it changes the psychology to see the US in a different position and brings diversity to the market. But I appreciate the question. I don't know if any of you wanna. Just, just the, you know, the, the, looking at our project that we have going in Brownsville, Texas and the, the feasibility and design phase and permitting phase now in an LNG facility, the, the, that is a long-term contracted facility that would be the offtake. It's more of a tolling agreement that the offtake from those type of exports um, are taken by customers that want to have diverse sources of fuel coming in. So if you look at Southeast Asia, they understand there'll be some cycle with that natural gas price, but they're willing to take that commodity, uh, uh, the commodity cycle to ensure a reliable and consistent supply. So fr from, the, from a U.S. standpoint, I, I, I think it's, uh, it creates certainty in jobs and certainty in demand for LNG uh, itself, uh, not in the oil business. So. All right. Um, one last question or issue to tie this all together. Listening to this whole panel, it strikes me that even a year, two, three years ago, there would not be the urgency around this question of preserving nuclear power option in this country that we see today. It's partly the clean power plan, it's, uh, it's other regulatory rules, it's inexpensive gas, and it's this very rapid policy-driven promotion of renewables and distribute it. Do you, do you feel that uh, a higher degree of urgency about this question than, than you would have even a year or two ago? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. It, it is um, you know, the reality. We start shutting plants down, the market's going to respond. There's going to be people making money, but they'll, it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think, I think you, you, you have a situation where you have these red flags that have gone up. Obviously, coal is re retiring, and it continues to retire. Decisions are going to be made about harvesting those assets in the future and retiring them as quickly as possible. Um, now there's rate implications of that and, and all that, but, but also when you see nuclear units retiring uh, yeah. because of market conditions, that's not a good place to be. Uh, and, they're not, and it's not reversible. It's not reversible, and, and, and I think there's not a really a good understanding from policymakers, number one, the investments that go into these plants and what it takes to continue to run and the ancillary impacts to the economy in general as a result. And many of these communities, we're shutting down coal units now, and some communities got halfway prepared for it, some did not, and all of a sudden they wake up and, and you know, fire protection, police protection, all those kinds of things are going away, and I think that's what you're trying to protect in Illinois. I mean, right. these plants actually mean something, and the utility industry shouldn't be seen as a cost center, it's a business. And, and we have to make sure that it's, that it's supported. Right. And I think the big difference, Dan, is a couple of years ago, we were hopeful we would see some policy changes. We, uh, you know, we had talked about the problem, but for example, at FERC, we continue just to see study after study after technical conference after technical conference. And don't you think some of the policies are actually going in the wrong direction? Ab absolutely. And, and I'm not, they don't understand the consequences. I mean, and w they really have to step up to start making some right. aggressive policy changes and, and understand what the real issues are. And unfortunately, politics plays a huge role in what gets done and what get does, doesn't get done. But you know, the consequences of shutting down a lot of these plants are significant. And I think from an investor perspective, you know, it's one thing to say you're gonna invest and you may have some negative cash flows in the front end. If you see no hope or nothing that's gonna change in the future, it's pretty tough to convince, convince investors to continue to deploy that amount of capital. Right. Don, do you wanna add anything? No, I the, the one question earlier I'll add to that, and Chris's answer, the, I'm a little more optimistic. It, it, the question was in you know, 20 to 30 years, do we see this getting fixed? And 
And I think so. It's the question, I think, is just how expensive of a learning proposition is it for this Between nation? Between here and there. Well, I think this has been a great panel, and uh, it's really, I think, demonstrated uh, both the timeliness and urgency of the whole set of issues that are being addressed at this nuclear assembly. And please, everybody, join me in thanking our panelists. I had uh, my personal thanks to all the panel members and to Dan. Uh, this is